African American legends highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, education, and legal defense. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I am your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining me on today's program is Ted Shaw, Associate Director, Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. The uh, Inc. Fund, as we call it, has done more to help improve the conditions of African Americans in this country than any other single institution. And Ted Shaw works with Elaine Jones, who is our Director Counsel. And Ted, we're going to be talking about what the LDF is up to right now. Well, first let me say uh, that it's good to be here with you. And uh, what we're up to right now, of course, is fighting a battle that uh, is really uh, understated in some ways. I mean, I think most people are not aware of what's at stake. I mean, we're really trying to hold on to not only the uh, gains of the 1960s and 70s, but we're trying to avoid being pushed back into the last century in some respects. As you well know, uh, the Reconstruction era in the 1800s was followed by the post-Reconstruction era after the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, and uh, this was a period of time in which black gains were eroded, and finally that culminated 100 years ago with Plessy versus Ferguson which ushered in the era of American apartheid. Uh, I think we're facing something that is comparable. I'm not suggesting that we're heading back to slavery, but I am suggesting that we're heading back to a time when uh, the discourse on race uh, is going to be a very stilted one and in which African-American opportunities are going to be on the wane as opposed to on the rise. Well, let me, let me uh, go back a little bit to some of the victories of the Legal Defense Fund going all the way back to when Thurgood Marshall was the director counsel, and we won those battles in the Supreme Court, the Brown versus the Board of Education, desegregating the public schools, several cases in recreation, uh, public parks, which I was an expert witness in, mm -hmm. the Baltimore case right? with Jack Greenberg. I wasn't aware uh, of that. Yeah, uh, that's part of my history. And uh, some of the cases in transportation, and then finally the uh, Civil Rights Act, which made it possible to go into court under Title VI and turn over lots of things involving employment discrimination, housing discrimination, job discrimination. And all of a sudden, in this country, in the 1980s and 1990s, people say black folks have gotten too far. And all I do to bring this into bold relief to indicate that the average income of the average black family, the average white family, is about 58%. So since it is that, that, it's very clear that African Americans have not reached parity, at least economically, and even in education. We find that on the average, African Americans are about one standard deviation below the mean in any of the standardized tests. And as you know, I've worked with the Inc. Fund and giving my advice on many of these uh, issues relating to education and testing. And now we are confronting head-on the attack against affirmative action, and I understand you recently have been to Texas to talk about uh, what happened with the Texas decision, the one involving higher education. So could you tell us a little about where we stand on that today? Sure. Let me just first say that uh, last term I had the um, opportunity to argue in the Supreme Court a case out of Kansas City called Jenkins versus mm -hmm. Missouri, and this was the first time that the Supreme Court had addressed the validity of a school desegregation plan on the merits that had been implemented there. And when you mentioned testing, it triggered this particular case. Um, in that uh, decision, the Supreme Court indicated that disparities on achievement test scores uh, between black and white students or between students in the Kansas City School District generally and students in other districts, uh, that that was not a proper measure of determining whether or not the effects of segregation had been undone. So uh, one of the things that most people in this country don't realize is that there is no constitutional right under federal law to either education at all or to quality education. The only thing we can do is try to use uh, the Equal Protection Clause where race discrimination has taken place to effectuate some change in the quality of education that black mm -hmm. students receive. It's a subtle point a lot of people miss. Well, the Equal Protection Clause is one of those Reconstruction Amendments that stood up. 
to the Constitution, the 13th Amendment eliminating segregation, the 14th Amendment equal protection, and the 15th Amendment That's the right. right to vote, which we have to go back That's in right. the court to, to sustain. That's right. And I know in the Missouri case, they've been talking about opportunity to learn standards. The black and white children have the same opportunity to gain access to knowledge. Do they have the same quality of teachers, same quality of uh, facilities? And even when you have that, the change in the scores of achievement are so slow because you're trying to eradicate literally years of past discrimination and past uh, ineffective facilities, ineffective teachers. So it's a subtle point which I think is even lost on the court sometime. Absolutely. Education isn't Absolutely. anything you snap your fingers and people That's learn. Right. And, and, and the courts now, the Supreme Court in particular and the lower federal courts, are very hostile to any arguments with respect to the intergenerational effects of segregation and discrimination, even though common sense tells us and, and what everything we see around us tells us that the legacy of slavery and the legacy of American apartheid, uh, that they have intergenerational effects, but the courts don't want to get into that. They don't want to deal with that. So you have reality standing over here, you have jurisprudence over here, and to try to put the two together is a real struggle. Let me talk about the Texas case that you mentioned. Uh, we, meaning the Legal Defense Fund, were uh, involved in trying to intervene in a case down in Texas uh, to represent the interests of African-American law students and college students who would be applying to the University of Texas Law School in a case brought by four white students challenging the University of Texas uh, admissions practices and policies. The, um, uh, the plan was put into effect uh, some years ago and uh, I want to be clear about something, and that's that we don't think uh, that the plan was structured very well. But this is not uncommon, as you probably know, uh, when it comes to affirmative action plans uh, in higher education. There are institutions which implement these programs, but they don't necessarily really believe in what they're doing. And because of that, they do it by the numbers. They do it the wrong way. This particular plan wasn't in compliance with Bakke. Mm -hmm. I and other civil rights lawyers told people at the University of Texas some years ago before they were sued that they were vulnerable, that they should change it, they weren't doing it the right way, and either through arrogance or uh, through some other kind of motivation, I'm not aware of uh, which it was, uh, they maintained their program. To give an example of what they did to make it vulnerable, they had presumptive admit and presumptive deny categories for applicants. They had different categories for black and white uh, applicants. I should say black and Latino on the one hand, and white applicants. And the presumptive admit category for black and Latino students, uh, that particular cutoff score was lower than the presumptive deny cutoff score was for white students. Now that made that plan very vulnerable. It signals separate pools for consideration. All of that violated Bakke. They didn't change it, but this is a state that was responsible for this that had its own history of segregation. You may remember the Supreme Court decided Sweat v. Painter in the late 1940s. Uh, Thurgood Marshall argued that case before the Supreme Court. It involved the very same institution, and that institution uh, now is before, uh, or apparently, uh, the state of Texas has taken us up to the Supreme Court, uh, is going to be before the Supreme Court again, uh, this time uh, in a case that could undo Bakke and have nationwide okay. effects. Yeah, talking about Bakke, uh, as a lawyer who's been involved in this, uh, it's a code word, you know exactly what it means, but could you explain yes, the yes. Alan Bakke decision who sued in California right. because he'd been excluded from medical school? Of course. Uh, as you know, that was a case that went to the Supreme Court in 1978. Alan Bakke was a white applicant for medical school uh, at the University of California, Davis, a relatively new institution, did not have, a, therefore, a history of uh, segregation or discrimination. And the institution had set aside 16 out of its 100 slots in the entering class for minority students. That program was also set up in a way that made it very vulnerable to legal attacks. It was a quota system. Uh, but some African Americans were supporting that at that time. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, I think one of the things that I, that I often find myself saying to people, black and white, is that if you f support affirmative action and you really have its interest at heart, you got to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do it the wrong way, you're undermining it. By the right way, you mean not setting up specific uh, numerical quotas. That's right, because that's going to make it vulnerable. 
you know, in, in, in the state of Texas, uh, for example, they could not have served up a better case to the Supreme Court uh, to undermine Bakke if they had intended to do so. Let me go back to Bakke, though. What the court said in Bakke was that race can be used as a factor in admissions as long as it wasn't the factor. Uh, so uh, just as admissions offices take into account uh, whether there's geographic diversity or uh, whether someone plays a cello or an athlete or is a son or the daughter of an alumnus or uh, an alumna, uh, all other factors are taken into account. They could take race into account as long as everybody is, in, is, is competing for all of the same slots. Now, that's been the law, even though it was a fragile opinion. It was really Justice Powell's opinion that control there. Uh, he kind of bridged the gap between two camps of, of, of justices. But it has stood since 1978. The Fifth Circuit said the week before last that Bakke was no longer good law. Now, uh, the Fifth Circuit, uh, uh, this panel, was pretty arrogant trying to overrule the Supreme Court. But they have been encouraged uh, by a line of cases over the last few years in the area of minority contracting and set-asides, redistricting, um, and also uh, in, in, in employment, in which this Supreme Court has indicated that it is ready to roll back the clock on race-conscious remedies generally and get out of the business of providing relief in many of the scenarios in which uh, we have built up uh, case law over the last 20 and 30 years. Well, let me ask, uh, does the Legal Defense Fund believe in race-conscious remedies? And if so, why? And if yes, what kind of race-conscious remedies? Uh, well, let me, let me come at that this way. Uh, we believe, I believe, that we have not reached a point yet in this society, even though a lot of people are declaring that we have, in which race doesn't matter. I believe that at the moment of birth, uh, a black and a white child's life chances, chances are different. Now, that doesn't mean that there's a guarantee that the white child is going to do better than a black child or the black child can't overcome whatever disadvantages a child may have. But the playing field isn't evil, even, rather. And as a consequence, I think that we need to be conscious of that. Now, in addition to that, there's still the effects of past segregation and discrimination, and there's continuing segregation and discrimination. Uh, we still live in a very race-conscious society. Uh, the whole idea or notion of color blindness, in my view, um, is uh, mistaken, uh, I think. Uh, uh, that is to say, that's not my goal. I'm not really working for a colorblind society. The question isn't whether we see color. The question is what significance it has. The question is how we treat each other once we've seen it. And as a consequence, uh, what we believe uh, is that we ought to be talking about racial fairness, justice, and, and equity. Uh, we are not at the point where we can declare ourselves to be free of our past or free of the continuing problems. Everybody knows it. I mean, just look at uh, the social discourse when it comes to politics mm -hmm. or what's going on in, 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 um, in our communities and the kind of racial tensions and divisions. People blame race-conscious relief for those problems, but that's putting, mm -hmm. I mean, that's inverting reality. Mm -hmm. They also attack the messenger. That's right. They, they attack That's right. the law and legislators and, and right. the lawyers who tend to defend it. You, you can't say that you want to solve a problem if you're going to blind mm -hmm. yourself to what the problem mm -hmm. is. And that's what many of the people who are advocating color blindness are really doing. Well, in some ways, I don't think they really believe color blindness because everything around them is related to color. But they do use examples of stars like Oprah Winfrey and Brian Gumpel and Michael Jordan and sure. Whitney Houston are saying they are millionaires and we aren't, so therefore they're fair, which of course is uh, totally ludicrous. But let's talk about the nature of a race conscious remedy, let's say, in contracting. Does that mean that an African-American company is guaranteed to get some work if they go to a pool with, with whites? Or does it mean that there are some other things that might be considered? I know this is one of the sure. type of issues that's widely discussed in affirmative action. There were two cases in contracting. Municipal contracting uh, was uh, the Croson decision. J. Croson versus City of Richmond decided in 1989. And then the other case recently was the Adirond case, uh, which was decided last term by the Supreme Court on the same day as Jenkins versus Missouri. Uh, that had to do with federal affirmative action programs. The law now is, the Supreme Court says, that 
any race conscious affirmative action program uh, in minority contracting has to be judged under what is called strict scrutiny. In other words, the most exacting standard of constitutional review. It is very difficult to uphold those programs under those circumstances, but affirmative action has not been declared unconstitutional itself. It's a question of whether you can justify it. Now, it doesn't mean, if you have one of these programs, it doesn't mean that the black company is guaranteed, uh, or a Latino company, a minority company, is guaranteed that it's going to get uh, the contract unless there are certain rare circumstances uh, in which, uh, because of a particular history, because of a particular set of problems, a small percentage of the contracting dollars may be set aside. But that has to be done on a temporary basis. Even those programs are now being abandoned by the federal government, given the tide of antagonism toward uh, affirmative action. So uh, in general, uh, one of the raps against affirmative action is that it, it guarantees success. It means quotas. Uh, it's, not unf it, it's unfair. Uh, and, and that's simply not so. Now there's um, also, I shouldn't, I, I'd be negligent if I didn't mention the California Civil Rights Initiative, which I know you're aware of also. Uh, it's going to be on the ballot in November. It's going to have a big role to play in this presidential election uh, because California's a must-carry state. The Republicans are salivating over that issue. Uh, because they think it's going to uh, win a lot of support for them. Uh, but in reality, what that uh, initiative is about is ending affirmative action programs for uh, people of color and for women. And for women. I was about, to, about to say, the major beneficiaries of most of these affirmative that's action right. programs have been women. That's right, and white women in particular. Mm. That's right. Uh, but that's kind of one of these dirty little secrets that people don't want uh, out there, the opponents of affirmative action, because as long as they can keep a black or brown face on it, uh, they can count on, they believe, winning popular support. But when it becomes a gender issue, then they're in trouble. So they're very concerned about it becoming a gender issue, which of course it is. Well, how do you uh, answer these folks who say, well, look, I'm a white American and my folks have been here, I worked hard, I have a job, and all of a sudden someone who's African American, Asian, Latino, comes in and gets a job with lesser qualifications than I have. How, how do you argue that? I know that isn't really the fact, but how do you argue that? Well, let me, uh, let me use the University of Texas case as an example. Uh, the lead plaintiff, Cheryl Hopwood, uh, and the other three individuals, uh, they were right at the, actually she was at the margins of being admitted uh, in the presumptive admit category, but had some other problems. She had a kind of a, uh, the, the courses she took were kind of weak. Um, the other three weren't that strong uh, candidates for admission. Uh, here's what happens. Uh, anyone who now is white and doesn't get a job, doesn't get admitted to an institution, uh, where there are minorities who are admitted, has this claim of reverse disc discrimination available to them that uh, sometimes they pursue. Um, the fact is that a couple of things. One is that we have to look at what we are talking about when we talk about qualifications. Many of these tests that are used uh, are of dubious predictive value. In Texas, we tried to intervene. Uh, I started to explain this earlier and didn't get back to it. We tried to intervene on behalf of African American students, and we were kept out of the case. Now think about that for a minute. White students suing a state that is a constitutional violator, has a history of discrimination and continuing problems, has never been found to be in compliance with Title VI, that is, never been found to have eliminated the effects of its past segregation and discrimination. It is defending this program. It's not going to fall on its sword completely. Uh, and black students whose real interests are at, at stake are not allowed into the suit. Um, uh, it, it, there's a problem there. And we've also seen this in the voting rights cases. Uh, these students were not kept out because of race. There's no comparison between the experience that they are having. You know, some white students are going to apply, some are going to be admitted, some are not going to be admitted. And what happened to Heman Sweat 50 years ago? The court's saying there is, but there isn't. When no matter what his qualifications, simply because of his race, because of the color of his skin, he wasn't being admitted. How can one say that in an institution that is almost 90% white, that white applicants are not being admitted because of the color of their skin, when in fact there are white applicants with lower test scores and grades who are being admitted. What that means is that the school is exercising discretion as it often does. The thing I wanted to really point to was in this case, we have a witness, an expert witness, we wanted to get in evidence uh, that he came up uh, and looked at the 
the Texas index. I won't go into the details of how this is calculated, but it's GPA and the law school admissions test, LSAT, the, and found out that it was not predictive and had not been predicted for the performance of African-American students in the first year at law school, as it's supposed to be. So it had no value there. We wanted to put that evidence in. The court didn't even let us in uh, the case to, to put that in. You know, if, if affirmative action is struck down at that institution and elsewhere, the University of Texas goes on. White students are going to apply. Some will get in. Some will not. Black and Latino students won't be at the table, and they had no voice. I mean, that's kind of the sign of the times and what we're dealing with. Yes, in a society in which there are structural inequities, some individuals can always say that, that, well, they can rise up. Mm -hmm. And other individuals are going to say, well, mm -hmm. I, you know, this mm -hmm. is affecting me somehow. And in a secondary way, maybe it is. But the, and, and that's a difficult question to answer. I'm not, I'm for affirmative action for uh, people based on this, uh, uh, on economic status also. I mean, many white working class p people don't get adequate consideration, don't get adequate uh, opportunity. But that's a different question than whether we ought to have affirmative action to cure our problem with respect to race. And we continue to have that problem, and we need to continue to address it. But what do you think needs to be done to change the political climate? Because the dialogue around affirmative action isn't really very positive at this point. You gave some very clear answers and there's a lot of data that indicates that affirmative action works, that those who get in are not substandard, they pass the test, they become doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, that the women get an opportunity to participate in the corporate world even though there are no mm -hmm. women CEOs of the top yes. 500, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, it suggests that there's a desire in opposing affirmative action to preserve privilege based on race and gender. Absolutely. But now how do we deal with that in terms of the political dialogue. It, it is really tough. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there was a, a piece in the New York Times magazine section you might have seen, it's been within the last year or two, mm -hmm. uh, where they went back and looked at yeah. uh, uh, Alan Bakke and what mm -hmm. he's doing now. Uh, and this is nothing personal against mm -hmm. him. I mean, I, I'm not even sure if he's practicing medicine, mm -hmm. but his career hasn't been anything spectacular by any means. And he looked at one of the uh, black uh, applicants who was in the middle of that controversy, uh, beneficiary of the Affirmative Action Program, who's serving the uh, South Central Los Angeles community and has had a stellar career by any means. Uh, the fact is, is that these so-called predictors don't necessarily work, as I've indicated before. And I just wanted to underscore that, given your question. Uh, the dialogue is stilted, uh, it's distorted, um, uh, you know, it's, it's inverted. Black becomes white and up becomes down. You would think that the history of discrimination in this country is one of, of discrimination uh, against white people at the hands of uh, people of color or women. Uh, it's very difficult to get the message out there because affirmative action equals quotas in the minds of ma many, regardless of what all the, uh, the realities are. You think that you or I could walk into uh, a job situation and say, here I am, I'm an African-American, give me the job, uh, regardless of qualifications. Um, I think, though, that we have to continue to try to get our message out. Uh, we have to continue to try to fight the fight in the courts, but elsewhere. Uh, we can't win in the courts alone, uh, not before the Supreme Court and not given a composition of the federal courts uh, right now. Uh, and in any event, without a, a kind of uh, uh, movement that would provide a base for uh, the courts thinking about these issues in a certain way, uh, in a more constructive way, I think, it's not going to happen. It's not going to change. Not that it affects us in the next five years, but the demography of this country predicts that by 2045, half of the country will be people of color. And given that so much of our technology, et cetera, has been determined by immigrant people of color of all backgrounds, uh, is it possible that just the the tide of history will catch up with us and that this will not be an issue uh, as strong as it is now. Is this not, to put it another way, the last gasp of white supremacy? It's hard to tell. Uh, I think you're right to focus on white supremacy as, as the issue. That's always been the issue. Uh, it, it, you know, it, and, and that's missing from a lot of the jurisprudence these days uh, so that you know, the court just misses the boat. Uh, but it's hard to tell. I mean, I think the optimistic view is that this is the last gasp. Uh, I think one of the real problems is, however, that white people will still be disproportionately empowered. That in itself w is not a, um, necessarily a problem. The question is what they do with that power and how they share it. Um, and if we don't educate and include uh, all of our citizens and educate people of color 
we're going to come to this point in which the country is majority uh, people of color and we're not going to be able to compete in the world market. It's a form of, of suicide if we don't address these problems. On the other hand, there have been a couple of major things in the society that have broken down people's negative attitudes. One is the success of the Tuskegee Airmen in the Air Force, yes, where course. we proved to be the best fighter group and led to the integration of the armed forces. That's and correct. the other is the success of uh, my friend and hero, Jackie Robinson. So there is some reason to believe that people's opinions can change, yes. however slowly. You know how long it took for us to get African-American managers in baseball uh, almost 40 years after Jackie Robinson had uh, hit the first ball in mm -hmm. April of uh, 1947. Uh, yes, so I, I think there is some reason to hope, yet at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't need a lot of work from folks right. like the LDF. That's right. I Look, there's no question that this, uh, this is a better country than it was 50 years ago because of, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen, the Jackie Robinsons, the uh, Thurgood Marshalls. Uh, it's a better country. And uh, many Americans' attitudes on issues of race have changed. And yet there's this deep kind of seething uh, uh, discontent uh, on economic issues, which then is exploited uh, along the old racial divide, and that's very dangerous. And given that that exploitation is leading to a period of what I call racial recidivism, in which we're slipping backwards, the question is how far back are we going to slip? We've got to be optimistic. We've got to continue to struggle. Okay. Thanks to Ted Shaw, Associate Director Counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, for talking with us today about affirmative action and the need for us to continue the struggle for fairness and justice in our society.